welcome to the Snetterton 300 circuit that brings the Intelligent Money British GT Championship into the second half of its 2023 campaign. We've had some excellent racing already this season with a variety of winners across both GT3 and GT4, but now it's time for the attention to turn to point scoring and those at the top of the championship look to build on a strong campaign. We've got 34 cars racing here across two 60-minute races. Short, sharp action as the day goes on, and it's set to be another exciting instalment in this year's championship. Welcome back everybody to Snetterton for part number two of the British GT adventure, the Intelligent Money British GT Championship uh, with its second double header of the season. We've had one 60 minute race already and that means we still have another hour of racing to go. Cars being brought around to the grid now in front of a big crowd here at Snetterton. The conditions still pleasant, albeit a little bit more humid and a little bit more overcast with every passing minute. Fingers crossed the rain stays away for the duration of the next six minutes or so. It's Andy McEwen here in the commentary box to be joined very shortly uh, by Joe Osborne. But right now, he is down on the grid alongside Bryn Lucas. Yes, he is, and he's looking resplendent in his white shirt as well, freshly pressed. Now, the wind has picked up, hasn't it, since the race we had earlier on, Joe? Yeah, definitely. It's definitely bringing in a weather front directly from the south. All the radars I've been looking at the teams are bringing rain in. I think we're safe by about 45 minutes at the moment, but we've seen here in the past when it rains at Snetton, it is super slippy. Yeah. That'll be a big headache for the drivers and all the teams here. Well, we saw earlier on, just talk tyres for a second. We, we were talking to Sandy Mitchell at the end of that first race, and they changed their tyres and put fresh ones on, on that pit stop, which was a strange decision. But he said, well, look, it's a no-brainer for us, really, because we wanted to win this race. We weren't sure what we were going to do in race two, so just bank the points. Yeah, they have a certain amount of tyres allocated for the weekend. They can actually carry over one set of tyres from previous weekends. So if they've had a problem or it has rained, they might have a new set, which Barwell did. Some other teams, I think, have saved one of those new sets for the second stint for the AM when they get in. So it's going to be an interesting race. Yes, it's one race, Easy but it's definitely two halves of it. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to that pit stop window to see what happens. Yeah, and the second race is net, and these, the second of these, these two one hour race is always a really thrilling one because the pro driver goes in first of all and so you get that real jeopardy at the end don't you of the am drivers maybe the less experienced drivers there having to look over their shoulders a bit more and try and maintain what they've got to, to deal with yeah and the pro only starts two races in the whole of the british gt season we've already had one at alton park and this is the last one of the year so it's their chance to really inflate their ego and show their peers how good they are at starting the car yeah. and it is there also their chance to make up some serious positions on the grid if they're not happy they're qualified They'll have a sort of an unspoken written rule there, Am. How much damage am I allowed to do? Can I do five, six thousand pounds worth of damage if it gets me two or three places? Yeah. So it'll be interesting to see exactly where those parameters lie down the grid. Well, it's interesting as well to see this, the sheer quality of driver that we have in GT3 and GT4. But just look around here. I mean, Ross Gunn's alongside me to my right, to your left as you're looking on. Jules Gounon is here, Rafael Marcello is here. There's also well, there's Dan Harper back there, Johnny Adam is here as well. The list goes on, Sandy Mitchell. They're really, really high quality drivers, aren't they? these pros. Yeah, and they used to compete against each other week in, week out, not just in British GT and GT World Challenge Europe, GT World Challenge America. So these guys know their positive and their negative traits. And it's like your younger brother or sister at Christmas dinner. They know exactly to how, how to make yourself look like an idiot in front of your parents. <laughs> so that's see. what I'm excited about. We'll see just how much of an idiot they can make each other look right now, shall we? But let's head back to Andy and then we'll hear uh, from some of the drivers in just a few moments. Yeah, good stuff, guys. Yeah, this is always an interesting race, this one, because the pros we know are almost inseparable in performance, really. Some slight variations in car performance, maybe, but generally speaking, they're all capable of lapping within a couple of tenths of a second of each other. So the second half of that earlier race was the quieter half, if you like, whereas this one, the pros start, the AMs get in later, and you can have a, a car that leaves the pit lane with an eight or ten second lead that still doesn't win the race because maybe there are some quicker uh, AMs further down the order. So it's always an exciting uh, race, this second one of uh, the weekend at uh, Snetter much the same as it was at Alton Park back at uh, the opening part of the season. Now, that opening race of the day earlier on today has seen a bit of a bit of chopping and changing in the championship standings with the Century Motorsport BMW now moving up in the points nicely. They were third, remember, in GT3 coming into this weekend, but the uh, red and black beamer that you just saw that will be started in this one by Dan Harper, uh, scoring 18 points for second place in the earlier race, and that has done their championship hopes the world of good. The 
uh, GT4 field also seeing a few changes in points structure as well as we arrive into this second race of the day. We'll get to GT4 in a moment or two, though, because down uh, with the pole sitter in GT3 is Brim. Actually, uh, me here, Andy, Joe, uh, better looking version. And with the best uh, in qualifying, Ross Gunn, obviously pole position, mate. We know he is hard to overtake. Going into turn one, you've got Jules Goon on alongside you. If you start to anticipate maybe what he's going to try and do to get in front of you in the first one or two corners is really where we see the normal overtaking happen here at the start of the race. Yeah, exactly that. To be honest, we uh, watched many starts from over the years. So we're trying to calculate what everyone's done in the past. Obviously, Jules is a world-class driver, so I'm sure he's going to be pushing hard to get in front. And then, as you said, it's pretty hard to overtake here, so the advantage of being on pole is, uh, is pretty good. Got to be happy with it, and I'm actually going to speak to the guy behind you to see how he's going to get past you. I obviously hope you don't, so uh, best of luck. If we uh, go and speak to uh, Raphael Marciello, just uh, that position behind. So, obviously, the front row is the best place to be, but third place here at Snetton. Gives you the inside line into turn one, but also turn number two. So it's like a double advantage, really. Raffaelli, nice to see you, man. Turn one, what are you thinking? Are we looking to go around the outside or trying to follow the Aston through the inside, try and get second place from Jules Goulon, obviously a man you know well. What's, what's in the back of your mind right now without giving everything away to the world? No, for sure it's not, it's not good to go in the outside. It's quite slippery. So, I mean, depends how, how Jules will start. But, yeah, if you start well, it's not so easy to overtake. Nice, I like it. You've got a little bit more uh, temperature and pressure in your tyres than Ross Gunn as well, so you're going to do it easily, mate, OK? Anyway, I heard from the front of the GT3 grid. Back to you, Andy. Yeah, thanks, uh, Joe. Uh, giving away all the trade secrets down there uh, on the uh, grid. But yeah, really interesting look to the front of that grid. I mean, you look at the drivers that we've got lining up. Ross Gunpole, Jules, Jules Gounon alongside him. Raffaele Marcello third. Dan Harp, one of the stars of this season in fourth. Uh, some real talent at the front of the GT3 field. But the talent is not limited to GT3. Plenty of it hanging around in GT4. Hey, Brent. Well, Charles, it's been a very, very good season for yourself and Jack so far this season. You're seventh in the first race so far here today. But when you look at the championship, how is it changing your mindset when you go into each race? Because 26 points ahead now and, it, you know, less races every, every single time. Yeah, so coming into this weekend, um, the mindset has sort of shifted um, to stop sort of winning the races and trying to bag points wherever we can and not taking as much risk. So that's the sort of plan today. Um, the genetics look very fast. Um, we had a good qualifying, but we're going to give it our all, but we just want to score points, to be honest. And no uh, pit stop compensation for you because of that seventh place as well, so you don't have that little uh, problem to overcome. Yeah, exactly. I think every race we've had so far, it's been a success penalty, so I normally come out and everyone's already in front. Um, so, yeah, looking forward to not having that and then see what Jack can do in the second stint. Absolutely. Well, best of luck. There you Thank go. You There's the thoughts there of the pole sitter, Charles Clark. Let's head a little bit further back on the grid then. If Ollie uh, come with me, we're going to walk down to see Seb Hopkins in the Aston Martin Vantage, the uh, GT3, uh, GT4, sorry. How are you doing there? Let's just step in and, and doorstep Seb Hopkins because, uh, Seb, you and your teammate got your first podium together this season. I know you got some uh, last season between you as well, but uh, how much does that mean for you and the team? Yeah, it meant a lot. You know, I think um, really since the first round, we've um, we've always been there. So um, to finally get it, it's been such a long time coming. Um, so um, it's just a hope of many more now, just trying to rack up the points and trying to, you know, um, start this championship over. It's been a very tough season for, for yourself. I think moving from Team Parker as well, where you're so used to the car, and then coming into this one, you've had to learn a whole new piece of kit with an engine in a very different place as well. So it's been very tricky for you. How have you found the, the adaptation? Yeah, it's been great. Um, it's been really good. I've, I really enjoy how the car drives. Um, you know, I, I don't think it's down to me and Josh's pace that's been the problem. I think it's just been so much other factors um, that have caused so many points losses and you know wins to be wins that have been uh, you know taken away from us. So. Um, yeah, now, now's the time to call that back again. Certainly, it's best of luck. Well there to Seb Hopkins. Let's continue our little walk, shall we, down the grid and have a look at a few more of the cars as well. So it's great to see the, the, the drivers chilling out in the cars getting ready uh, for this one, the second race. And as I was saying to Joe at the very, the very beginning of this, really, it's an interesting time because when you've got the pro or the more experienced driver in the car to start with, you then have to deal with the fact that you've got your Ram going in second. And they have to take on quite a lot of the responsibility. We're just going to head a little bit further down. 
because Dan Vaughan is here. Look at one very quick word from Dan Vaughan because Dan uh, had some real problems with that car in the first race. They had to retire the car, in fact. A quick word from the team. Let's just dive into the team very quickly. Uh, I'll come to. Let's see. Uh, Dan's here. I'm going to quickly knock your mesh, I'm afraid, just so we can get to you, um, Dan. How's the car now? Because the problems earlier on fully fixed. Uh, we'll see. I'm not sure yet, but. Um... The team have worked really hard and I think you know we've done all we can so just a case of going around and seeing what happens but we should be okay. Was it gearbox just to clear it up? Yeah, yeah it was gearbox. So we sort of compiled on the issues we've had all year. It's sort of we've just been unlucky at the minute. Well let's hope the luck changes. Dan, yeah. thank you very much indeed. Best of luck. There you go. About to start the race and so up to Andy and to Joe for race two here at Snetterton. Yeah, thank you very much, Britta. Dejected Dan Vaughan there, I have to say. I think they're well and truly due a little bit of good fortune. Well, what a tantalising prospect this second race of the weekend is. Let's remind you all of how they're going to line up with the Beach Dean Aston Martin on pole position. We've had Aston Martin success over the years here at uh, Snetterton. Perhaps another victory could be coming their way. Jules Gounon lines up alongside, though. He's going to be on his toes into that first quarter. So too, Raphael Marcello for Ram Racing starting third. And then Dan Harper, the car that we believe now leads the championship in GT3, starting from the outside of row number two. Michael O'Brien and Johnny Adam together on row three. Johnny Adam one to watch in this one for sure as he tries to get that points lead back. Race one winners, Barwell Motorsport will start from seventh. Sandy Mitchell at the wheel for the opening stint, whilst Callum McLeod is in the Greystone GT car that's qualified inside the top ten for both races today. Marcus Clutton in the Enduro car that sustained bodywork damage on the opening lap starts ninth. Wiltra Gertha completes the top ten in the second Barwell car. Then it's Rob Bell in the Optimum Motorsport Sport car, that car's got five seconds of compensation time to serve at the pit stop. Sam Neary starting alongside was in the top five in race one. Martin Plowman and James Kell, a pair of McLarens. Paddock Motorsport and Race Lab sharing row seven and row eight uh, is where we will find Ewan Hankey and Chris Froggart, another two of the McLarens together towards the back of the GT3 field. Next in line, we will have James Wallace, Oliver Webb in the Greystone GT. McLaren will be next, and then we start moving into GT4s uh, where we do see. Uh, another McLaren at the front. It's the championship leading car of Charles Clark with Mike Simpson for Toro Verde GT alongside. So we've still got Janetta's near the front of the grid in GT4, but this time it's not Raceway, it's Toro Verde looking strong because Joe Wheeler starts fourth alongside Seth Hopkins third on that second row of the GT4 grid. Row three then for Josh Rowledge in the DCO Motorsport McLaren, Darren Burke in the Enduro Motorsport example, and then the fourth row within GT4 sees Freddie Tomlinson in the car uh, that ran so strongly in the opening race Lewis Plato starting eighth alongside him. Top 10 in GT4 completed by Tom Rawlings and Michael Broadhurst. And then towards the back end of that uh, always competitive GT4 field, we find a few cars actually that should move forward. Dan Vaughan, if they fix the problems in the team park at Porsche. Tom Wrigley in the race lab McLaren that is second in the GT4 points. Then Chris Salkeld and Matt Cowley. All of them quick drivers, all of them quick cars. Should make forward progress. The same true of Thomas Holland really. With Matt Nichol Jones, the company at the back of the field. The uh, Ford Mustang for Academy Motorsport, struggling a little bit, it seems, this weekend. So cars making their way around then, Joe. Your predictions very quickly for this race. Almost impossible to pick a winner, really, uh, amongst those first couple of rows. Some really, really fired up drivers, I think, keen to try and get their weekend on track. Yeah, when I factor in the championship and where cars are, it's always the outliers that I think are the guys willing to risk more. Rafael Marcello P3 is probably the one that sticks out the most. Mikey O'Brien, the JMH McLaren behind him. For interestingly, they're both on the inside. And like I said, the first two corners being right-handers, it really, really helps to be on that inside. You factor in actually at turn two, the resurfacing just on the racing line. So the outside is even dirtier and slippier. I think the inside guys are to be the cars to watch. That orange McLaren and the blue, white, fluoro, yellow uh, Mercedes there from Ram Racing. And we've seen in some of the support races this afternoon as well, the outside line at Rich's turn one is covered in dust. So if you get out wide there, uh, it is not going to be a surprise to see cars skating out onto the grass. Chris Froggart there looking like he's concentrating hard as well. He might. He's in for a busy stint here, I think, uh, starting towards the tail end of the GT3 field. This Raffaele Marcello's, Marcello's view, or at least uh, the view from his passenger seat of the front row ahead. The Aston Martin of Roscoe on the right, the Mercedes of Jules Gounon alongside. Let's see what happens then as the sixth round of the Intellig Intelligent Money British GT Championship gets ready to go here at Snetterton. Two by two to the line. Ross Gunn will get the race underway from pole position. They roar past our commentary position and the Aston Martin will lead them down to turn one. Dan Harper already on his toes trying to find a way past Jules Gounon. Goes from the outside to the inside. They kind of get stuck in the middle and in the end they stay grid order through the first turn. So good leads. Gounon second. Marcello third. Harper fourth. 
moved onto the outside into the Wilson Heavy. Can he find that grip? No, he can't. Marcello sees his chance, gets his nose up the inside line, but the traction on the outside line means Gunnar is still ahead and might even get up the inside of Gunn. No, the door is slammed in his face and the Aston Martin stays in front. It's a really good start. I actually feel like Marcello had an agreement with Gunnar and let him in nicely at turn number one. Teammates in other championships definitely might be a possibility. Gunnar had a mega run out of turn number two. Russ Gunn just then got the drive, which was enough to close the door too wide. Marcus, Cl Marcus Cluston, sorry, going around the outside of Callum McLeod. Big slide from Wilter Gertha there. Rob Bell on his inside, I think it was. See the cars darting around. The front five look a little more settled at the moment, though. Interesting to see. Let's give it a lap or two. Let's let the tyres come in and see where that is. Big, oh, no. big, big damage for Freddie Tomlinson. Our race one uh, winner. That's like a huge front end bonnet has gone on the exit of turn number one. Interesting to see what happened there, but it looks like he's parking up for the day. Not common to see cars get turned around out of that first corner. We'll wait to see if we can piece together what happened. On board now with Marcello, heading down the Bentley straight into the braking zone, underneath the bridge, flick it left, bumpy no, corner, braking yeah, on a turn, then you change direction into hey, Nelson. Yeah, These guys know what they're doing. All of them inch the perfect on the line from Nelson. Not too further back, though, slipping a tooth wide. That was the number three Greystone Mercedes wide over the kerb. Callum McLeod, I think, has lost some position, started eight, might be a position or so further back than that as they come towards the completion of the opening lap. It is Ross Gunn, though, for Beach Dean, who leads the way. Jules Gounon going with it. Yeah, it looks like everyone's just finding their fees, aren't they? There's almost equidistant gaps between the first five now. We saw Dan Harper, really, in that red century BMW, currently P4, the man of race one in terms of the overtakes. So let's see where he starts to go. Strength of that BMW really is top line speed. And that's probably the weakness of the Mercedes in front. So when you get the difference of disparity, that's when the overtakes happen. Sandy Mitchell having to go to the defense there on Clutton. We saw Clutton having a mega opening lap getting around the outside. He's gonna try and do the cutback. He's gonna take the racing line, the right hand side for turn three, Palmer, which will then make Sandy Mitchell slower out of it. And he's gonna to have to try and do another cutback. I think he's done the opposite. He's gonna hang it all the way around the outside. The problem is he's still on the outside. Maybe there was a yellow flag out there that you saw, and it's going to be interesting. All the cars have a driver display showing the flags that are at the corner they're in. The Marcus Clutton keeps the attack going, so we're going to have to come back to that one. Sandy Mitchell got great drive, didn't he, out of that hairpin, and that makes him live to fight another day. Yeah, they drop away now from the cars ahead, and uh, while well, still Sandy Mitchell having to defend, Marcus Clutton really fired up, trying to find a way past, still looking for that switchback that just isn't coming. Sandy Mitchell knows where to position the car in order to uh, close that door, and so the Lamborghini retains the advantage for now, uh, seventh in third position, heading down the back straight. There is the leading group, not a huge amount of variation as you'd expect in the sector times, although the leaders a little bit slower than the third and fourth place cars through that opening sector, and as we saw in the early stages, Ages of race one. It's the 67 McLaren that looks really, really good on low pressures, closing in on the four ahead. Now, we saw the drama for the 56 car in the GT4 field. Maybe some replays at the start will help piece this together. Down to turn one they go. Three wide for the race lead, Joe. And there, a major stack up. Yeah, it looks like they are racing. Aston's had to get on the brakes. The DTO car's gone in the back, and then Tomlinson's gone in the back of the DTO car. So just that concertina effect, it's hard. There's very few times you get to practice the start, the speed being off the racing line. So your braking point on a normal lap becomes irrelevant. See, Clutton's still hounding Mitchell. We've seen the bravery of Clutton many, many times over in British GT races to try and go around the outside like he's done already. Really shows good intent, doesn't it? Mitchell's willing to really defend this. But amazingly, they're not losing that much time, are they? They're sticking with Johnny Adam in front. Callum McLeod's not really catching. So at this moment in time, I think he's doing the right thing, Sandy Mitchell. Super aggressive on the defense. Gone in pretty deep there. Can Marcus do anything? Just don't get the run. That's the hard bit. Still can't see if there's a yellow flag out there. The car's in a safe place. All the drivers know it's there. So maybe race control decided it's no longer needed to have a, a yellow flag out at turn number three. Yeah, it was definitely out last lap, but I think you're right. It might be in now as Sandy Mitchell wanders wide from the apex down at Agostini, but again gets that run off the corner from the high line and uh, keeps the McLaren behind. Just now starting to drop away from Johnny Adam with that latest little side-by-side -side exchange where briefly Cluck was on the grass heading into Palmer managed to gather it all together. Of course, this car ended up in the barriers quite heavily at Donington last time out. 
Marcus is keen to avoid a repeat of that. Now, just saw a big moment there for Dan Harper in the uh, Century Motorsport BMW, which, uh, again, had a good first few laps, but as in race one when Darren Leung was starting the car, then seemed to fade as the laps went by, the top three getting away, and Michael O'Brien now starting to apply the pressure. Yeah, we saw exactly that problem for the BMW in the mid-speed corner. saw Ross Gunn nail one of the markers there under the bridge. It went flying. There'll be no damage on that, but maybe an invoice from Jonathan Palmer later in the week. Uh, it'd be interesting to see where the BMW goes. I thought it was going to be the stronger one. He has gapped again, hasn't he? See Mikey O'Brien there, really struggling under the brakes, cars squirming all over the place. Then he hit the sausage curve. Marcus Clark's just dropped off the back as we go to the GT4 leader, Charles Clark. Got a little bit of a gap to Mike Simpson behind in the Toro Verde 86 uh, Ginetta, but not a bigger gap. We've seen him really check out, haven't we, in previous races and able to really get going. Flushing his headlights, slow going Mercedes. Looks like he's got a problem. Wallace there probably coming into the pits in that drive tech car. Can't see an obvious problem in terms of uh, all the tyres look inflated, but uh, he's doing a really good job of staying out of the way of these GT4 guys because uh, they're in a pretty fierce battle. Uh, possible damage to the right front corner, I think. Maybe a puncture or suspension damage by the way the car was sort of hobbling over the kerb. Anyway, the GT4 leaders go past him. And yeah, Mike Simpson keeping the pressure on for Charles Clark here. That Charles Clark car with a big points lead. I think the tyre is off the rim completely, isn't it, on the right front corner. Early in the race, Joe, that can sometimes be contact, sometimes a kerb strike, but uh, either way, race ruined for them. Yeah, it looked like it's a bit of splitter damage, but obviously without the tyre, the splitter's rubbing on the floor. So the drive tack guys are going to just bolt one new tyre on, should push it back, although it was at the uh, signal of doom from one of the mechanics slicing his neck. No, they're, they're putting it back on, looking happy. So you just push it down. Obviously, this can't count as a mandatory stop, but before uh, the pit window opens, so they can't do a driver change, but uh, those guys are going to have to pray for a safety car now. They're going to be a long, long way back. That uh, turn one incident within GT4 is under investigation. Not that that's going to help Raceway Motorsport too much, but uh, the DTO car was involved in that, as was our racing. So those cars under investigation by the clerk of the course see the DTO car in the front of that group. They're sending the drive tack car back out, so it was just simply a uh, tyre that needed replacing, uh, but they will now be needing a safety car to have any chance of getting back into the fight. They rejoin uh, just as the overall race leaders there, the GT3 lead pack, was coming out of the final turn, and Ross Gunn continues to lead the way. GT4 leaders already half a lap or so behind. Yeah, you can see uh, the disparity in speed between the classes. It's great. In race one, we saw on the ninth lap, the GT3 starting to overtake so we're halfway there, which I guess is why they're half a track uh, length apart. I think the DTO car, the McLaren, the black and white one, is actually missing its whole rear diffuser. When we had one of the rear shots, looked like it was completely gone. So that car will be struggling, especially rear end high speed grip. So uh, lucky for them, it fully came off and wasn't flapping around. They would get a mechanical flag for something like that. Uh, Marcus Clutton still looking racy, isn't he? He's on the back of it. Johnny Adam not able to get away and stay with that lead five car pack. We're all just starting to space out a little bit. They've all sort of worked out their strengths and weaknesses by now. They'll be thinking, if I haven't got a massive overlap of pace, then this is down to my arm. I might be better just to save the tyre if they're not planning on changing tyre. Even the brakes, you can just look after the car that little bit better. And the arm always feels like a, a bigger comfort blanket if the car feels like it's nice and tight rather than you've wrung it by the neck for 32 minutes or so and everything feels a bit sloppy. So uh, that'll definitely be a consideration for these top guys. None of these three uh, top three cars have any compensation time to be added onto their pit stops either. So it's a genuine fight here. Dan Harper, though, in fourth, when he brings that car in to hand over to Darren Young, will have that extra seven seconds to serve because they finished second in the previous race. So top three work their way through. In the first sector, Gunon faster. Second sector, Gunon faster. In fact, two purple sectors here for Jules Gunon. So maybe he's just been dropping things back for a lap, cooling everything off for a real push. This could well be a new fastest lap of the race. And what was a nine-tenth of a second lead appears is to just be creeping down slightly. The AMG turns its way through the final turn. He's bringing Marcello with him. Actually, Marcello fractionally quicker uh, in that middle sector, even the Gunon, as the team Parker Porsche is sent back to the garage again. What a disaster. Yeah, they've had an awful weekend. That's off the back of a DNF at Donington Park as well. So I think that's why Dan Vaughan sounded so dejected on the grid. He almost felt like he knew it was coming. Maybe he felt it on that green flag lap, but didn't want to tell us. But uh, yeah, these first three starting to pull away. 
an interesting, I don't know why I always say interesting because it's never that interesting, is it? but the first four cars are front engine and we don't normally yeah. see that at Snedston. The, the mid-engine cars have always historically gone better here. But interestingly, again, all four of them are front engine and pulling away from that first mid-engine McLaren. And, and why is that mid-engine important? They're, where they're coming to now, turn number four, such a big traction zone. Some cars will even be using first gear. It's so slow here. So the drive out the corner, having that big, heavy lump of metal over your rear axle just gives you a better squat. You see the cars hunker down and go, whereas the Mercedes, for example, Callum McLeod, there, you can see the rear doesn't go down because it doesn't have the weight to push it into the floor and weight is grip. So uh, maybe we'll start to see those tyres go off a little bit more in those front engine cars because of the weight distribution not being over the rear. You always work the rear tyre harder in these sort of races. It will just light up. The traction control is there to save you, but there's still slip going on and that's why you see so much rubber down on the track. It's all these cars lighting up those big Pirelli rear tyres. Jules Guinon did set the fastest lap last time around, but now both Ross Gunn and Raffaele Marcello having a go at sealing it back off him because they both had uh, a purple sector apiece. Meanwhile, Marcus Klutt is sort of fading away slightly now from the uh, Sandy Mitchell Lamborghini, which, remember, has 10 extra seconds to serve in the pit stop as the 78 car. Uh, when we get to that, the pit window opening 22 minutes into the race. We are 11 minutes into this one, and it's been relentless so far with not a huge amount of separation at the front. Top three uh, pretty equidistantly spread out as they come across the line. Three quarters of a second was the advantage for Ross Good. It goes up to eight tenths of a second. Uh, 147.5 for the top two, 47.6 for Marcello and Harper 47.9 matched by Michael O'Brien behind. So as we're used to seeing really, a tenth is all that is actually separating the lap times really across the top half dozen or so. Yeah, and so incredibly consistent. Gunon currently has the fastest lap of the race, which is actually a new lap record as well. One tenth faster than uh, Ulysses de Powell, who did have the lap record in a Mercedes but run by Ramsey, Joe Wheeler looking to the inside there. Rowley, you actually see the damage on the front of that DJ McLaren. Like I said, he was the sandwich in that first corner instant. Aston Martin was in front of him and the McLaren, sorry, the uh, Ginetta of Tomlinson was behind him. So they've been in the wars a little bit. They had a big hit in FP1 as well, actually. And you can see the damage on the right-hand door was from uh, the legacy of that. So these guys have had uh, more hits than Tina Turner this weekend, don't they? But the car still looks straight. Yes, it's mi missing its rear diffuser, but the pace is really strong. So you just need to get through to that pit stop and then you get this second go. And that's what I'm starting to think about, especially in GT3 where everyone hands over to an AM. In GT4, we have a mix of silvers. Some will be handing over to the AMs and the Pro-AM. But in GT3, they're all AMs. And who do you fancy? Gunn to Howard, Gunon to Loggy, Marcello to Ferguson, Harper to Luang, O'Brien to Orange. We've seen quite a disparity in that. Normally, Loggy, he's got the number one on the guard. We know he's strong, but he's not been quick this weekend. So I think that's going to be hard work. He said traffic in uh, qualifying hampered him. So we'll see that on board of that uh, DTO McLaren I was talking about. Looked all good turning in. No major handling imbalances. Like brought us there in the, uh, the one motorsport. Mercedes starting to get a bit more pace. Spoke to him earlier in the, in the day. They're really struggling for front end grip on that Mercedes. So done a big setup change ahead of this race and seems to be going well for them at the moment. Uh, just kind of hang on to the back of that that secondary pack, isn't it, in GT4? Had a change for third in GT4 that time as well. Lewis Plato ahead of Seb Hopkins, that Century Motorsport BMW ahead of our racing Aston Martin. Uh, both of those cars were in the podium fight in the race earlier on today. As here, the number 80 Ginetta then that was started by Joe Wheeler in this race continues to apply the pressure uh, to uh, Josh Rowledge ahead. The perhaps wounded DTO McLaren is still holding strong inside the top five for the time being, running about where it finished actually uh, in the early race. There is Lewis Plato in the BMW ahead of the Aston now, uh, putting in some good sector times as well on this particular lap to try and chase after the leading two. I'm going to see a change here for fifth place, not through Rudler Nelson. McLaren keeping Rach Detter at bay, then the Mercedes in line behind, as you said, uh, looking much stronger in this uh, particular race. In GT3, Roscoe nine tenths clear of Jules Gounon. Raffaele Marcello, though, with another purple first sector. So impressive here, Joe, that 15 minutes and seven laps into the race, we're still seeing personal best sectors up and down the board. Yeah, you really see this trade-off, especially with this new spec Pirelli, the DHF tyre, that as the fuel comes off, obviously the car's lighter. Yes, the tyre's losing life, but the Pirelli tyre seems to hang on 
almost as well after its first new tyre hit peak. It's then good really for another hour and a bit. So as you're losing the fuel, I heard a few, I was in a few garages earlier, I overheard some numbers, it wasn't espionage, but I know cars starting with about 90 kilos of fuel. So obviously that's gonna burn off pretty equally. The pros always use a little bit more because they are going faster, but we're 25% of the way through this race. So I'm just trying to do some quick math as I talk. So it's about 22 and a half kilos. They've probably burnt off so far. And that's a big difference. That is probably worth three or four tenths. And if the tire's not dropping off, that's why we're seeing purples from Raphael and Marcello. Fastest lap has gone as he goes across the line. And he actually does beat Marcello's lap. And he goes for a new lap record in that Aston Martin. So these cars are all starting to come alive a little bit more. We're going to go into this secondary phase. We spoke about the pit window earlier. The GT3 window opens at 22, but obviously the Pro is faster, so they can stay in until 32 minutes. The GT4 window opens at 28, and we always see a more even spread on the window there. So I do think the pit lane is going to get very, very busy with about 32 to halfway through the race to go. And it's interesting here at Snetterton. We know we have more cars than garages. We know the cars are longer than the garages are wider. So some teams may opt to pit their pro early just to get a clear and free non-stress to hit the Mercedes bottoming out on the exit curb there. Race control get all the same pictures as us, so potentially a track limit warning there. The, the new Motorsport UK track limit rules are so exciting. You can't put a single millimetre of your tyre over the white line or a red and white curb. So especially for Gunon and Marcello, who is so used to racing in Europe, we have a completely different rule to everyone else for logical reasons. And it is hard for these guys to get into it. And you've only got four errors. You make four mistakes. The next one is a five second penalty and you haven't made five seconds up with those track limits. So of course they're mistakes and they should be punished, but the punishment is pretty hard. So it's not worth just burning them up this early in the race because the AM inherits your penalty. You use all four up and he does one, you get the five seconds. That's where it starts to get really tasty towards the end of the race. Indeed. So speaking of penalties, drive tax day getting even worse. They've been given a stop go penalty for having the engine running whilst the car was on the jacks. That was the reason for the hand gesture I'd seen from uh, one of the team members telling the driver to turn the engine off. But the warning came a little bit too late. So they're already the best part of a lap down and they're going to have to bail for the pit lane once again. Through street, the GT3 cars, 1.3 seconds now. The advantage for Ross Gunn out in front. The gap's ebbing and flowing by a couple of tenths now. Uh, each lap, but still only 2.1 seconds covering the top three. Dan Harper now a little bit lonely in fourth position with, Colin, with uh, Michael O'Brien in fifth, Johnny Adams sixth, Sandy Mitchell seventh, Mark Scott eighth, Callum McLeod ninth, and Rob Bell in tenth position. But that could now all start to change, Joe, because not that far away we have the GT4 cars within the next half a lap or so, I think, being caught by the race leaders. Yeah, exactly. And it's always hard as the leader. We say it all the time, you're the first guy to wake up that GT4 car. Yes, the cars have mirrors, but when you're the GT4 car, you've just done your first eight laps of the race. You haven't had to look in your mirror because you're unfortunately the last person on the grid. And then suddenly the race leader, who doesn't want to lose a single tenth of a second, wants to get past you. So it's always hard. You've got to be positive at Ross Gunn. He's known British GT inside out. He raced in GT4, GT4 Champions, so he knows it on the other of a foot, but it is still a hard job, and we're about to get in that flashpoint. And all the GT4s are really bunched up. There's almost three big groups of six cars, so that makes it even harder for the GT3s to find their own space. Indeed so. This could get very exciting then. They're in the final sector now, the race leaders. We are following here the second of the Barwell Lamborghinis. Will Tregertha sits in 11th place. He's got Ewan Hankey on his tail, and right behind him, Martin Plowman ducking around, uh, trying to distract Ewan as they went into the uh, braking zone under the bridge. Uh, but no mistake is forthcoming. And then behind them, Sam Neary having a strangely off-colour race, really. Ran well inside the top five in the earlier race, but did seem to be struggling a bit for pace towards the end. And that uh, bright green team, Abba Racing Mercedes, struggling to move forwards in this uh, second race of the weekend. They come through then to complete their 10th lap of the race. The lead gap back under a second and just in the nick of time, really, as far as Jules Gounon is concerned, because here comes the traffic. Dan Harper in behind Thomas Holland in the Janetta. And now corner by corner, Joe, these gaps will start to change. Yeah, and you can just get so much luck. It's impossible to explain how the luck works through sometimes and doesn't. While you're looking at these cars, there's obviously a lot to take in. The yellow headlights are always GT4 and the black windscreen banner is GT4. White headlights, white windscreen banner, GT3. So if we get a quick look from the front, that's the best way to distinguish the differences in the class. And it looks like Gunon has lost out a little bit in that first wave of traffic, doesn't it? Gunn is actually in front of that GT4 McLaren, separating them. Marcello right on the back. Blue flags being waved by the marshals, always doing a mega job at any British racetrack. But uh, 
again, the GT4s will get the blue flags, but it's their job to keep up the pace, and the GT3s have got to find a way around them. It's going to get down the inside there, a bit of a lunge. You can see the GT4 want to turn in, then have to take the steer and lock off. Marcelli more compromised than Gunon in front, onto the back straight, so loses that bit of time again. That's really the ebb and flow of it. Ross Gunn going to get past one of the Academy Mustangs, but probably will get stuck behind the Enduro McLaren through the right-hand part of under the bridge there. So you can really see it's starting to get busy, isn't it? Uh, absolutely. And we've been saying all the way through this opening 20 minutes that the pros are lapping within a tenth or so of each other, and suddenly you throw in the traffic and they can lose the best part of a second just in a couple of corners. Dan Harper there gets balked by the Paddock GT4 McLaren, and that brings Michael O'Brien immediately onto his tail. O'Brien was a full eight tenths behind him at the start of the lap, and now they're absolutely nose to tail, as are the GT4 race leaders, because in the second half of this opening stint, it does look like Mike Simpson is closing in on Charles Clark, only two tenths between them as they came through to complete that previous lap. And at some point on probably this next lap, the GT3 leaders will catch the GT4 leaders, and then it could start to get really exciting. Yeah, Ross Gunn's really had the rub of the green so far. The lead gap now up to 2.1 seconds. It's going to get so busy in this infield. If you catch him on the two straights, you can get away with losing zero time, obviously, in a straight line. But as soon as you're compromised into the corner, it's Gunon going to go for Wheeler. Wheeler's closing the door, saying, I don't want you to overtake, and does close that door. Raffaele Marcello might be able to get down the inside. Has he got a run? Runs wide, uses maybe one of his track limit warnings. Gunon's going to block the track, naturally overtaking the DTO car of Josh Rowledge. You can see the dust being kicked up. Gets down the inside. The DTO car, nowhere to go. Is that going to give Joe Wheeler a chance? that Ginetta that we saw being overtaken at turn three. That's, again, you might get overtaken and lose time, but it might give you an opportunity. Joe Wheeler's still just behind that car. Marcello, Marcello so, so over the curb there. He's really using the track limit warnings. There's a sensor there that he'll be tripping every single time. And the front wheel bouncing clear off the ground as well. That was quite a rough ride over the curbs for him, but it uh, won't deter him from pushing on as they head down the Bentley straight again, continuing, though, to lose time to the race leaders. Change for the lead in GT4. So we've got the Ginetta ahead now. Mike Simpson was right on the tail of Charles Clark at the start of the lap, and he's now ahead, and by a decent margin as well. A good second or so now separating the two, and this is how he did it. Oh, and to turn two down the inside giving him a punt and spun him around. It's a uh, hard angle to call it from. I mean, it looked like Charles Clark was committed to getting into the apex. Hard to see how far down the inside uh, Mike Simpson was in that Ginetta, but I mean, Charles Clark did a mega job looking how little time he lost to fully get spun round and only have lost probably a second and a half is a mega, mega job. Look at Sandy Mitchell stuck behind Wheeler now. That splits him up. Marcus Clutton has lost even more time though. We know he's on the back of Sandy Mitchell. Look at that, it's probably two and a half seconds all cleared them it's going to be difficult to see who's got the main advantage at the moment we need to get them all the way through but i think ross gunn will be a very happy man 3.3 seconds ahead of the line he's got no more gt4s to overtake probably until the end of his stint Jules Gunon versus Raffaele Marcello. We've seen it many times down the years. Never before at Snetterton, but this is uh, as good a place as any for these to go toe-to-toe. -to -toe. And right now, Marcello looks the quicker of the two, maybe just having a bit more fortune in the traffic, but Gunon is struggling a little, flashing the lights at the second-place GT4 car, which turns across his bows. That's going to delay Gunon mid-corner. Marcello goes to the outside. He's got the overlap, but the wrong side of the road to be, really. Gunon, again, breathes a sigh of relief. We are 22 and a half minutes into the race, by the way, so the GT three pit window has opened but as uh, Joe was explaining early we don't really expect many of these pros uh, to be in the pit lane before a uh, little while at least Marcello and Gunon then through the worst of the traffic now Gunon has weathered that particular storm it'll be interesting to see now whether Marcello can keep applying the pressure or whether it really was just the traffic bunching them together yeah it was hard to say every time we go on on board with Marcello he does look lively that guy he's having to work the steering wheel a lot of oversteer and obviously we're only looking at Gunon from the outside, from the rear of the car, but the car looks more stable for Gunon. You never exactly know what's faster for the car. A bit of oversteer is good, a bit of rotation helps. Understeer can be equally as slow, if not slower than an oversteer car. But when the AM gets in, historically an AM prefers a little bit of understeer, just that safety of the car, not trying to spin round and chuck you into the scenery. But, uh, they still look pretty even. They see Ian Loggy getting ready, so he will take over the number one two C's cars. It's a lot of numbers and one go. But yeah, I think we're probably going to see them pitting in about seven minutes, would be my guess. They're at the start of the pit lane two C's, so they shouldn't get so bunched up as teams will do in the middle of the pit lane. Obviously, if your neighbour either side pits, you've got a very small bit of real estate to work with. 
goes the 22 BMW, which is still running strongly third place within uh, GT4, and actually gaining now nicely on Charles Clark, who may well have some damage uh, after that contact down at this part of the circuit a couple of laps ago. Sandy Mitchell slips up the inside of him, whilst Michael O'Brien continues uh, to apply pressure to Dan Harper. Been stuck behind the BMW for a while now, but the McLaren driver just can't quite prise the door open. And in a way, actually, now that they're out of the traffic, there's a bit more clear track, more scope maybe, to try and slip alongside the Beamer, which we know is operating really well down the straight, but through this technical infield section, Michael O'Brien really able to close in. BMW, of course, also has that extra time to serve at the pit stops. So doubly frustrating, really, for O'Brien, because that car will leap from the BMW inevitably during the pit window, uh, but he's still physically losing time to it on the track. Number seven paddock car is uh, in the pit lane. I think we saw that car uh, in strife earlier on, didn't we? So it's uh, been brought into the pits with some sort of a problem. Not yet in the GT4 pit window, needless to say. So if they get going again, they'll have to head back to the pits. Just saw team manager car 86 being summoned to race control. So Mike Simpson obviously saw take the lead. Hard to see from the angle we saw, was it fair? <laughs> it's hard. If Mike thinks it was fair, that's what he's done. He's carried on. If he wasn't sure, his best option would have been given the place straight back to Charles Clark. Hands up. I made a mistake. None of us are perfect. I'm sorry. Let's go again. He obviously didn't think that. I I've actually had it here. Nick Tandy fired me off under the bridge in a massive 360. And then he was waiting for me on the start finish line. I was like, God, this guy wants to finish me off. He actually just gave me the place back and we carried on. And he overtook me fairly annoyingly and got the win. But um, yeah, that, that is an option. It's not a written rule. The race director still might not be happy enough with it, but that is the best option. You never get someone to race control to be told you're doing a really good job. It is only ever a negative, unfortunately. So I'm sure the Toro Verde guys will be pleading their case. And the best thing they can ask for is really a review after the race to have a look at the, all the onboard cameras. But race control have a lot more views than we do. With all the CCTV, even the GPS footage on these cars really shows a bit of a, a story sometimes. So it's going to be a hard one, I think, for him to potentially to get hold of that incident. Wait and see then. More news on that as and when we get it. Rafael Marcello here continuing to hound Jules Gounon uh, in their ongoing fight for uh, second position. The 3.6 seconds now, though, shy uh, of Ross Gung. But as we get closer now to that pit window and the inevitable driver changes, uh, we start to think who's going to have the advantage. Andrew Howard will jump in to the number 97 car. We Loggy into car number one. John Ferguson into car 15. All of them capable drivers, and uh, in at least two of those drivers' cases, former champions uh, of the British GT Championship. But who is going to have the pace here today at Snetterton? That's the question. Ross Gundo has certainly given Andrew Howard the best possible opportunity to hold on to this race lead. If he can bring that car in three or four seconds up the road, that is a very healthy margin uh, for Andrew to try and manage. 10 second stop go penalty for car 86 for causing a collision. Not the most shocking piece of news that I've delivered today, but Mike Simpson from the lead of GT4s being given a 10 second stop go penalty. That is a shame. That is gutting. Ginetta winning race one was was mega and it looked good, didn't it? Mike Simpson was strong. Yes, he's a pro amp, so will be handing over to James Townsend, who's a super rapid amp. But compared to the silvers, they get less time in the pit stops, 14 seconds less. So I think James being a fast bronze had a chance of an overall win today. That drive through with a stop and go is going to be 30 seconds loss. That's almost day done, isn't it? Unfortunately for them, it, it's so gutting. And when you're the driver that's guilty, you just can't start to understand how possibly you could be wrong as Mike pits for that, uh, that drive through and stop and go. Mike O'Brien bringing the car in early. Like I said, some guys I thought might do that to try and get a clear bit of space, bolting new tyres on as well for Simon Orange. So I thought some hams might have saved a set. It's going to be interesting if Simon Orange can get that. I'll keep an eye on his times as he leaves the pits. But it's going to be hard for him to do an undercut on any of the pros that are on track. All of them are in clear air. If they were catching GT4s again, then possibly they could do it. Team manager controlling the car there, release after 10 seconds and be on their way nice and clean. So uh, probably will pit in the next lap or two anyway to do the driver change. You can never do the driver change in a drive through just to uh, clear anything up on that front. And that now moves Lewis Plato into second in GT4. He, that's also a Pro-Am car, the car that he shares with Carl Caver. So that car will likely be the race leader uh, once GT4 pit stops are done. But you'll have Carl Caver as a bronze-graded driver being chased down by the other silvers uh, towards the front of the field. Right, when do we see this car into the uh, pit lane? Pit window, remember, closes in three and a half minutes. So they've got time for one more lap then. 
and I suspect that Ross Gunn will be keen to take that extra lap. Not clapping quite as quickly this time around as Jules Gounon, though. Gounon was three tenths faster in sector one, four tenths faster in sector two, and it was another purple first sector there for Jules Gounon, uh, even halfway through the race. So we'll see that gap's going to start creeping down towards three seconds or so, I think. As we are on board uh, with Chris Froggart then flicking from the left to the right through Brooklyn Nelson, the Barwell number 72 car of Will Tregertha ahead of him. Tregertha was 11th, I think, last time we saw him. Ewan Hankey has found a way past since then uh, and disappeared up the road as well, rather, uh, with now uh, Tregertha trying to fend off the Sky Turn Festa racing McLaren as we approach pit stops. You can see the car squirming under brake into the last corner. So much going on for the driver. So you've got the rev lights going up. We see Tregertha box a lap early shifting up and they all go blue few cars coming in that's hanky Tregertha, kel and webb all just trying to beat the rush to get out and in clear air so interesting to see loggy is ready all the other gt3s need to box this lap so everyone's going to dive for the pit lane there's no other strategy they can do now unfortunately so teams a long pit lane you can see cars stopping at the start of the pit lane and cars versus at the end i always prefer to be at the start of the pit lane push back early and you've got time to manage your speed to the end of it the controlled pit lane you can't do it too fast if you've left a little early you can just ease off the throttle a little bit i suspect that's what the century car did earlier with harper in and boxed in a couple of cars you cannot go more than 10 kilometers an hour slower than the limit so it's 40 here so you can't go below 30 but you could just cruise down and block a couple of people in and then you're in front of them track position James Cottingham ready to take over. Fastest man in the AM GT3 qualifying by nearly half a second yesterday. What's he going to be able to do in inheriting a fifth place car? You would say he's the fastest AM in that top five, but what can he do about the four in front of him? It'll be interesting to see. Well, it'll be the three in front in theory, won't it? Because of course the 91 car has extra time to serve in the pit. So uh, that is a very good point. That car could well be a contender uh, in the closing stages. Right, here we go then. Pit stop time. Top three cars will dive in. Ross Gooden will hand over to Andrew Howard. Jules Gounon who charges into the pit lane entry I gained a bit of time I think there on Russ Gunn that was a really good entry uh, for Goonon he'll hand over to Ian Loggy, Marcello to John Ferguson Dan Harper to Darren Leung and Johnny Adams as we've just discussed to James Cottingham the only one of those five with extra time to serve is Dan Harper the seven extra seconds for the century car Barwell 78 has 10 extra seconds five extra seconds for the number 27 optimum car as some new front tyres get fitted to the number four yeah it looks like they're all doing tyres isn't it both Loggy and uh, and Harper is handing over to Lenk taking tyres don't look new though can't see any stickers can't see any sort of shiny releasing agent there half having to get his seat out the way different size drivers can drive the same car so easily these days seat inserts and also the pedals in all of these cars actually slide backwards and forwards Froggart coming in undoing he'll put that belt up on a magnet so when Kevin Say gets in board, on board sorry he can just pull that down there's one of those seats inserts going in gonna go in he'll pull up the middle belt between his leg Loggy already pushing back Hopefully he doesn't block his teammate in there. Ross Gunn now handing over to Andrew Howard. Push back, straight release. You can see Ferguson being held by the Ram team. Is he going to be in front or behind? It's still behind. That guy's head from Century Motorsport made it a bit more dramatic, didn't he? But all in the same order at the moment. Is uh, Darren Luen going to drop back? Well, I think that even the Mercedes have, really, haven't they? Because that's a bigger advantage leaving pit lane than Ross Gunn had coming in for my money. Uh, so we also saw the Thomas Holland Ginetta in two. That's because the GT4 pit window opened 28 minutes into the race. So uh, the GT4 starting to dive in as well. Cottingham uh, leaping up the order as we expected, with Darren Leung coming out at not only behind him, but also fractionally behind, uh, I believe, the Simon Orange McLaren too. Yeah, and Kevin Say there just pulling away now. Either the stalled or the car control got on the radio and told him to stop. I don't think it would have been that because it looked clear. Luckily, Garage 59, just with the one car in this race, have got more space, so it wasn't compromised at all. But that's the problem. You just stalled, and you, then you panic, and you lose three or four seconds trying to restart it. Then the amount of times you stall a second time because you've rushed it again, it all really starts to unravel. But they're going to really struggle. They've dropped quite a long way back, haven't they, after a decent start from that car. You can see some uh, legacy damage, I think, from race one tried to match the tape but uh, haven't quite nailed it so Ferguson on the back of Loggy Ferguson's been really racy isn't it start of this half a lap kicks up a bit of dust there in the in the face of one of the little GT4 Ginettas but uh, Cotting has a lot of clear space so he's a long way back probably seven seconds behind that battle but there's no other cars in his way 
and he was, as you quite rightly pointed out, considerably quicker than the other Ams in qualifying yesterday. Uh, Team Abba Racing, by the way, being given a stop-go penalty for exceeding trap limits. That was handed out just before Sam Neary uh, came in to hand over to his father, Richard. There is Jules Gunon. His job is done, in a way. Now he can sit back and watch the master at work, the reigning champion, Ian Loggy, as he tries to defend this second place from John Ferguson, who is never backwards in coming forwards. And Ferguson right on his tail. There's a bit of traffic up the road. He's sideways up the inside through Corum. Surely not. What a move by John Ferguson. I'm not entirely sure how he managed that, Joe, but he's into second place. He just threaded the needle with a massive shoelace, didn't he? That was insane. The GT4 McLaren was doing the right thing. I think Loggy was too conservative, didn't think that Ferguson would put a move on him, but that was that was Ooh. super. Loggy back to the inside. He knows historically he's been a bit faster than Ferguson and doesn't want to get held up. I was about to say, I'm surprised Jules Gounon hasn't got a headset on. A lot of the AMs like to be coached, even over the radio. I'm not talking to them as, as much as I'm talking now, nonsense, but information. This is what you're going to catch this lap. Think about overtaking here. Remember, don't overtake a GT4 car there. X, Y, Z. Try and keep them calm. Find a rhythm. Make it metronomic. Big slide for Ferguson there. But he's pulling away from Loggy, isn't he? Loggy has not had a good couple of races. Race one, not particularly fast. Donington struggled. We're starting to see a bit of a falter with that number one, the reigning champion. Cotton in the background, looming in as well, taking a couple of tents out of them in, uh, in sector one alone. So I think this is going to get spicy. I can't really work out which way it's going to go at this moment in time. Well, what I can tell you is that Ferguson was four tenths quicker than Andrew Howard in the first sector alone, but that gap had almost doubled. It was about three seconds when they came into the pit lane. It was six seconds at the end of the outlap, but now John Ferguson starting to do something about that. Uh, even quicker than him, though, was caught him in that first sector. And quicker again, Simon Orange, who was also rapid in the opening stint of that earlier race. So Andrew Howard leads in the Aston. John Ferguson second in the Mercedes. Ian Loggy third. James Cottingham fourth. Fourth, and here the replay of the move from the Ferguson Eye view. So there's the inside line there anyway, and he almost is forced, taken by Loggy breaking early. I feel like Loggy's trying to sort of block past Ferguson getting down the inside. Loggy was like, I'm not going to overtake before the last corner, so I'm going to cover off the inside so Ferguson can't overtake me. But Ferguson's like, fine, I'll take the racing line and get in front of you and claim track position as we turn in for the last corner. Left hand, you see him getting more traffic in the last corner. That car looks loose for Ferguson. Loggy's got a run, he's going to try and squeeze him over there. What's Loggy going to do? We saw him have a little look into turn one. Loggy was racing here a few weeks ago in a different championship. Had a huge crash there, the GT4 McLaren, Mercedes, sorry, probably going to help Ferguson out a little bit in that regard. Loggy played it safe and it was the right thing to do in hindsight. He should have been on the back of Ferguson following him through on that GT4 Mercedes. Well, that little bobble there for Ferguson at the final turn meant that actually the lead gap went out by a couple of hundredths of a second. So uh, still stands at 5.9 seconds as their Enduro Motorsport work on their GT4 car now. GT4 pit stops well and truly getting underway. This is the car I anticipate will have the lead after all of this because the 22 car has got no... Um, I know, sorry, it's the other car I'm thinking of, isn't it, that will have the uh, extra time not to serve in the pit lane as the uh, driver change takes place then. Out of the 22 will get Lewis Plato, in will get Carl Cavers, and that number 22 machine should be up towards the front in the second part of the race. Some of the strongest material in the world, tank tape that all race teams swear by, just going on the splitter there, obviously cracked it, I assume, with a bit of damage. Quite a strong part of the McLaren that, so it wouldn't have been curb damage, so it must have just hit someone there. Mike Simpson now pitting again, but this time for the driver change over to Townsend. So this car's going to be right at the sharp end, doesn't it? It's been so quick all year. Really, really hard to really pick fault with them at any point. Hence why they're championship leaders, I guess. But uh, Jack Brown's had a really good stint. Him and Charles Clark have really gelled this year as well. Makes such a difference when you get on with your teammate. Sometimes you get to a race weekend and I've had teammates that I despise and he's like, I just want to go home. And you look at the watch and it's still Thursday. And those boys have got on so well. And it just makes a difference. You talk better, you communicate better. The car's setup goes better it's all positives so uh, I think those guys are also in a good chance to be at the sharp end of the GT4 so Andrew Howard kick up a quite a big bit of debris there over the start finish line carbon fiber is so sharp can slice the tire open so so easily that they uh, they do need to be careful with that one team manager of car 97 
to race control. Now that is the race leading Aston Martin. They gained three seconds in the pit stop. I wonder if they miscalculated slightly in that rush. They knew how tight it was coming in, had to try and beat those Mercedes out. Andrew Howard is now continuing to build that margin. But as we've said, often when a team manager is summoned to race control, it's to notify them that a penalty is coming their way. Yes, yeah, the only thing it can be as well. They had such a clean stint with Ross Gunn. Uh, I can't think what else it could possibly be. The only thing I'm a little concerned by at the moment is that optimum McLaren GT4 is talking about has and pitted no, sorry, don't mind. Carry on. Um, so it's going to be interesting. They get back from race control. If we see any number in terms of a stop and go, then that is what they were under their pit stop time. We don't unfortunately have the pit stop timing here in front of us, but the team's normally so well drilled in it, especially with the lead they had. Did they need to be that close to the win? I would say probably not. And even if it's a drive through, what's the lead? Six seconds. They'll be all the way down, I think probably in fifth place behind Simon Orange. Just looking at the timing screens, Andrew Howard's last lap was the quickest out of anyone down in a 50.8. That's the best lap I've seen him do. Pulled a second over the Mercedes behind. So, I mean, I'm saying he's going to lose a lot of time. If he's pulling a second a lap, he's got a chance. But the problem is as soon as you get the drive through penalty, you've got to serve it within three laps. So he's just not going to be able to get enough time over his rivals, I think comes up behind the car that is about to move into the GT4 lead. It is the 22 BMW then that is a, a Pro-Am car and therefore did not have to serve that extra, extra 14 seconds in the pit lane. Look at this though, second, third and fourth in GT3. John Ferguson getting away slightly now from Ian Loggie, but James Cottingham is there. If the 97 Aston Martin is destined for a penalty, this is the fight for the race lead and James Cottingham and Johnny Adam have a real, real chance of claiming another race victory. Down towards the Wilson hairpin they go and we get the official confirmation a one second stop go penalty for car 97 for being one second too short in the pit stop so it will very shortly become a mercedes amg one two three and john ferguson ian loggy and james cottingham's battle becomes even more intense really does and ferguson's still struggling with the rear of that car and he's getting to get the traction control up look at the run that he hasn't got versus loggy that car's squirreling all around the higher you go on the traction control the more intrusive it is it stops that slip and then slide He's really cautious on the exit, costume's rapid. So we've got three, uh, sorry, three Mercedes, two different teams, Rammer leading from two two seats cars. Look at it again, really lively that thing. Costume is so, so quick here at the moment. I think Johnny Adam has done a mega job. I spoke to him earlier in the weekend. He's down the inside of Loggy. Is he gonna get down? No, he's not, he tucks back in. Johnny Adam said they've actually gone completely separate ways on setup, the two sister cars. And I think it seems to be co suiting Cottingham more as the am. Johnny's almost taken a little bit of pain He's a little bit off the pace of those front Mercedes guys at times, but then Cotton is so quick, overall they're a better, better package, and that is where he, and why he's won so many British GT titles in my opinion, he sees the bigger picture. There's no ego there to worry about being faster than his qualifying. He's more worried about winning championships, which I tend to agree with as a strategy. Tell you what, Jules Gounon's been through an emotional roller coaster, and he's only been out the car for 10 minutes. He now sees his car coming right back at the number 15 Mercedes, which we know is about to inherit the race lead, because Loggy uh, has really started to get a wriggle on and pulls up alongside John Ferguson off the final corner. Here comes the challenge for the race lead then. Ian Loggy to the outside. They bang doors once, twice, almost three times. Watch for James Cottingham up the inside. The three AMGs absolutely together as they head for Ridge's corner. Loggy to the inside. Cottingham round the outside. It's the dirty side of the road. Can he find the grip? Yes, he can. Loggy will try and come back at him but can't get there. Cottingham goes second. Ferguson somehow hangs on to the race lead. It's getting very, very physical indeed. Andrew Howard has pitted. This is for the lead of the race with 18 minutes to go. That was epic, wasn't it? Uh, when you're going along the pit straight there with two big egos, neither of them want to let go. And that is what happened. Loggy looked like he was on the front foot to inherit the lead. And suddenly he's now behind his teammate in third place. What's Cottingham going to do? He'll be thinking, wow, Ferguson's racing. He's happy to be strong. I've seen that happen in front of my very eyes. So I need to come with this fight with some fire ready. If I was Cottingham, I'd be ramming the back of Ferguson. My first opportunity saying, I've seen you be a bully. You know what? I'm a bigger bully than you. I'm a horrible man, even though he's lovely. It's That's the procedure you need to go through, the bravado of it all. What's he got? The pace is there, is the overtake. That's the next big, big question. Well, it could come at the end of the Bentley straight because he's only a car length behind. He'll get a bit of a slipstream, had a better exit for my money. So John Ferguson's going to have to defend 
Now, Cottingham could go around the outside here to get the inside for Nelson. Is he going to do that? Is he going to go to the inside? Well, they both sort of hover down the middle of the road in the end, so no major advantage is found. Uh, driving standards flag being shown to John Ferguson, just a warning for the time being, but he's not going to be paying any attention to that right now. He swipes across the nose of Cottingham's Mercedes, and Loggy could get me in the pound seat. Cottingham with the inside into Corum. That is not a place you want to be going wheel to wheel, and sensibly backs out of it. I wonder what odds I'll get on now of these three Mercedes all finishing this race because at the moment Ferguson is fixated with keeping cars behind him. Here we go, round two. Different two C's car on the outside. What's he going to do? He's given him a bit more room. Cottingham actually gives him the squeeze back into turn number one. There is no way Ferguson is going to allow Cottingham to go around the outside. Loggy will know that. He tucks back in. That was a sharp move. Johnny Adam agreeing <laughs> with that statement there. Then to the inside. Loggy's trying to be aggressive but knows it's his teammate. Can't really really hitting there. Simon Orange now reeling them in as well. They're battling at such a rate. They're losing 1.8 seconds a lap to Orange. So he's going to be with them in the next two and a half laps. There's still 15 minutes, 16 minutes remaining. But this is going to get so, so intense. I, I can't see Ferguson holding the tide back. But at this moment in time, he's got some pretty sturdy floodgates on the back of that Mercedes GT3 AMG car. How far is he willing to go to defend the lead? Well, he misses the apex by a mile. And Agostini is this Cottingham's chance can't quite get a full overlap, I don't think, as they head down towards Hamilton. But with every corner that the race leader defends, that McLaren in fourth place gets closer and closer. Johnny Adam could hardly watch now as his car, which, remember, came into the weekend as the championship leading car in GT3, fights now for another race victory. It would be their third of the season, would you believe? It's been a cracking season so far for the number four two-seas motorsport machine. Can they do it? Can John Ferguson fend them off? Will Ian Loggy still benefit? Any of those are still possible, I'd say down into the braking zone, Cottingham up the inside, Ferguson late on the brakes and he'll just park the bus now on the apex of Nelson, stop the switchback and still he's fending them off. Going really, really well, isn't he? You can see more and more marbles building up as we look down the back straight. So every time Ferguson moves over to defend, he is getting detritus on those tyres, which ultimately loses grip and can make the car feel like it's got a massive, massive issue. So he's going to be starting to feel that all these cars laying down so much rubber, even over an hour race, these tyres taking so much life out of that rubber just naturally strips off. Johnny Adam trying to look cool. I haven't seen him speak on the radio yet. He's obviously happy with their game plan. Cotton knows what he wants to do. His championship in the hunt, isn't he? Can't afford a DNF, but the law of a win is probably still stronger at this moment in time than that championship overall in my mind for him. Almost a mistake there for Ferguson, just got it into the apex. I mean, yeah, points are all well and good, but this is such a competitive championship these days. You have to try and win when you get the chance because it's not going to come about every single time. And I think that's really where Cottingham is feeling now. He's not been in the best of moods, really. It's not been the best of weekends for him. He feels like he's been beaten down a little bit, and now he has a chance to make up for everything, forcing Ferguson to defend again. But John just about is getting it slowed down for the corners, not making friends with the apex, but not running massively wide either and retaining his advantage. Simon Orange, by the way, is two and a half seconds now behind this lead group, and on the previous lap was a full 1.1 seconds quicker than the race leader, and Andrew Howard rejoined in sixth position, so a top five is still possible, I think, for the Beach Dean car uh, right in behind. In fact, Darren Leung with the Century BMW, so all is not lost for him. There are plenty of great battles going up, on up and down the order, but this is a fascinating scrap between three of the feistiest AMs on the grid, I think it's fair to say. Definitely, and the hard bit now for Cotton is he's almost lost that momentum. He caught up so quickly, got past Loggy really well, but now he hasn't been able to get anything on Ferguson in two or three laps. That confidence just goes. He's having a, a few too many little looks for me. These cars don't break for bomb hole where they've just gone through. So for me, don't have a look there. You're not going to catch his eye. Ferguson will be fixated in front because he knows it's hard to overtake there, almost impossible. So he just needs to save it up. Be interesting to see if there's any taxis gets a slight run on him, doesn't he? Out of that last corner as you go on board with Miller here behind that uh, Ginetta. See the differences in straight line performance. That Ginetta seems to have got a bit of a break at the moment coming into turn one, then back to the lead battle overall. Like I said, Cotton's just looking too often, is he? Looked again there, lost his momentum, lost that gap. He needs to save it up, see how close you can get. Simon Orange now looming in, isn't he? That's only one big defend away from Ferguson. He's going to be right there. Then suddenly we've got a meat sandwich. So Loggy's been really happy, hasn't he? He's been the bread. He's felt pretty happy. Nice slice of sourdough. Now he's about to become a big bit of pastrami with Orange backing him up hard. And I think Orange is going to be even more aggressive 
the three most aggressive drivers we've got on the grid because he's got zero to lose in this championship. Missed around at Donington due to other commitments. So he's got nothing to lose. It's a brand new car as well. So it'd be insured nice and high. Might as well write it off now. Stand well back, everyone. This could be about to get very, very exciting indeed. Up towards Oggies, Cottingham again, hunting to the inside, but he's just that length or so too far back uh, to really commit to the move. And Ian Loggy, I think, is now content for the time being, just to keep a watching brief and see if this falls into his lap. But the team might be able to do that once that McLaren arrives on his tail. A reminder, by the way, as you can see from the picture in picture, we've still got good battles going on in GT4. That class being led for the time being by Carl Cavers, but he's been caught by Jack Brown. It's actually less than a second between the top two uh, in GT4 right now, of course. Uh, that is because Cavers is an Am Brown, a silver-graded driver. He is lapping a little bit quicker, but hasn't yet made the move, nor has James Cottingham. Try as he might, can't unlock the door, can't find a way past John Ferguson. It's been a brilliant defensive drive, this from Ferguson so far. 11 and a half minutes minutes to go. Joe, do you think he can do it? I think he can. I just don't think it's going to be clean. And the clean element will be whose fault was it, Cottering or Ferguson? So Cottering needs to get at least halfway down the inside when he does overtake to make it more Ferguson's fault there was contact than his. We just haven't seen enough chance to get an overlap or any momentum to make it a fully clean pass. That's why I think there's potential contact incoming if we do see a race lead. Ferguson's got a bad run out there. Going to try and go round the outside. He's got a little bit of help that Loggy's not looking down the inside, but Orange was looking down the inside of Loggy, wasn't it? Real late dive bomb, struggled to get a good exit, but he's now shown Loggy his intent. Costume just needs to uh, give me half a lap of chill. That's what Johnny will be saying. Just follow in his wheel tracks. Don't jart out. Just concentrate on exits. Good exits lead to good exit speeds. Good exit speeds equals free time. And that's what he needs to be looking at. It does look like he's just done that. He's gone in nice and deep into this turn four hairpin. Get the drive out. All of these guys doing pretty well of track limits at the moment. Keeping on the timing screen. Although we do have a black and white flag for Ferguson for track limits. So he's had two black and whites. Luckily, not for the same offence. So he is on his last, last warning. One more, he's going to get a five-second penalty. That would be the easiest overtake that Cotton could hope for. It would, but it wouldn't really solve the problem because Ferguson would still physically be in front of him. He would still have Loggy and Orange right behind him. He still kind of needs to make the move stick, doesn't he? Speaking of making the move stick, we have now got Jack Brown ahead of Carl Cavers in GT4, so the uh, championship leading car already with nearly a 37.5-point lead. That's significant because that's the amount of points you score for winning any of the final three rounds this season. Uh, and, uh, well, it's going to extend even further now, isn't it, with that Brilliant overtake. Still a pro-am lead though for the Century BMW and that doesn't look hugely likely to change. They're about 11 or 12 seconds clear of Carl Brady, which has Ian Duggan at the wheel for the time being. They're the fight for fourth position with uh, Darren Leung fending off Andrew Howard. Andrew now being warned about track limits as well, just to cheer him up ever further. And there is the Sky Tempesta Racing, number 93 machine uh, with Kevin Say back on board now. Side by side for the race lead by a nose. It's cutting him ahead at the line, but he's on the outside line into Rich's corner. We've seen how this can end. Ducks back into the apex, tries to get up the inside into Wilson, but Ferguson is quick through the corner, and now Loggy on his toes to try and take advantage. Orange up the inside of him for third position. The McLaren not quite late enough on the brakes, actually, but it does have the inside line. No, the move isn't made. Loggy stays in front, and this is the challenge now, Joe. Each and every one of them, particularly the two in the middle, they're having to watch in front of them, behind them, alongside them. If they go for a move, it has to be decisive because the tiniest loss of momentum will likely cost them a place. Yeah, smart driving by all of them. Simon Orange looked aggressive, didn't he, with the position of the car, but actually broke relatively early and didn't try to get down the inside. But he would have logged that Loggy gave him the space on the inside. So if he does a similar move, potentially Loggy's not looking particularly racy to close that door. Cotterin was on the outside into turn one, just overslowed it, went for the cutback, but lost too much momentum and wasn't able to carry that extra speed that the cutback should allow you to do with that wider trajectory on entry. Oh, big, big damage, grabbing so obviously front damage and rear damage. The leaders are going to catch this car. Where is he going to go? Is he going to try and get back to the pits? He should park it up. He's doing a mega job. He's getting fully out of the way. He looks like he's on the track, but that is actually way off the track in that position. So that was really fortunate for John Ferguson. That could have been quite an interesting thing to trip over. Uh, that was Michael Priest, whose race, I think it's fair to say, is done. He had been, uh, well, sort of on his own, actually, 1.6 seconds behind Eric Evans and uh, several laps ahead of the next car. So I'm not entirely sure how he's managed that or where he's managed it, but lots of damage done to the raceway Ginetta. Yeah, if he's not near him, got to be the tyre stack on the inside of Hamilton. And like I said, in race one, super heavy. So hit that, couldn't ah. do it. And the Mustang has damage, though. So I think maybe that's 
the uh, the other piece in the puzzle something hanging off its right hand side so uh, maybe that tyre stack was innocent in this one what's kind of got it's just I can't really say which part of the track is stronger than Ferguson it's a little bit everywhere but he's not really allowing us to see which bit is the big difference of course they're the same cars orange to the inside again that was late got it down the inside Lockheed's so fair with him I, he was a long way back. I think you've got to be closing the door on that. I think you want to fight it. He's, he's given up a third place a podium position. Maybe he wants to get home early. He doesn't want the podium presentation. But uh, what it does do is release Orange. And now Cottingham doesn't have a sister car behind. He has got a completely different car with different strengths, run by a different team, obviously, but also not in the same championship position as him. So I think this is going to get super interesting with, what, four laps remaining. That's exactly how you called it, though. He had that dress rehearsal a lap ago, Simon Orange realised that Loggy wasn't going to close the door and took full advantage and committed to the move the next time around. It just buys James Cottingham maybe one free attack here without having to worry too much uh, about the McLaren driver behind him. He's all over Ferguson as they head onto that Bentley straight and I think he will get alongside here. A good run down the straight. Ferguson interestingly leaves him the left-hand side of the road free. That's the inside for Brundle but the outside for Nelson. This could get interesting. Dirty side of the road for Cottingham. Ferguson sweeps across in front and keep an eye on Simon Orange. The bright orange to McLaren in third position, looking to try and take advantage of this. That was the one free attack that Cottingham had, and now the top four are back together again. And Johnny Adam is fuming for Johnny Adam. He actually looked very calm, but he looked dejected. Cottingham did mega, he got down the inside, it was his corner. Ferguson did a, a great job of going back over to the racing line, giving him the most grip into the left under the bridge. Cottingham should have forced himself all the way up onto him to open up that angle. They were on the opposite sides of the track, they just didn't maximise it there, Cottingham, in, in that regard. And going there, Orange is going to be looking at this, I think he is licking his lips. I, I know we don't see a lot of overtaking here clearly, like I keep going on, but I really fancy Orange at this moment in time. Uh, well, especially given how good he is on the brakes, he's maybe close enough to Cottingham to try it again. Looks to the inside line, this is his move, but Cottingham just crept across to the inside line, covered it at the last second. This is fantastic racing. Uh, disappointingly, only five and a quarter minutes of this race to go, so a couple of laps remaining to settle in, and four cars after 55 minutes of racing, a pit stop, a driver change, compensation time added, and we've got the four of them covered by a second, as again Cottingham looks to the inside, Ferguson moved to cover, Ferguson trying to almost play them all off against each other but he's very wide this time can Cotting will get the overlap inside line to Hamilton no Ferguson still keeps in front Cotting was just weaving all over the place even the extra distance he's having to do over the lap is adding up on him he just needs to consolidate Orange is looking racy could even get a cut back here out of Oggies doesn't get quite the drive of that Mercedes such a good torquey V8 engine turbo V8 in the McLaren sometimes a little bit laggier Ferguson wide again he's got to be so close to track limits hasn't he we're really really struggling here to see who's going to get the advantage at the end of this straight. You can see the bodywork's all starting to flap as well. Everything's getting fatigued, us and the cars. Uh, tell me about it. Oh, look at Loggy now peeking to the inside of Simon Orange again. Uh, Andrew Howard, by the way, has been given a 30 second penalty to be added on at the end of the race for speeding in the pit lane. Cottingham's up the inside into the bomb hole, has to back out of it. You cannot go side by side through there, and he knew what Ferguson was going to do. Here comes Simon Orange up the inside, trying to take advantage, can't move into second place. And again, John Ferguson can breathe a sigh of relief. He stays in front. There will be two laps to go in a race that I don't want to end. And Cottingham is starting to get fed up, massively outbreaks himself into Murray's, and now is a sitting duck down the straight. Simon Orange with the run. Which way does he go? He's forced to the outside line. Does he have the momentum, the speed down the straight, creeping slowly alongside the AMG, which holds the inside line. Can Simon Orange sweep round the outside? It's risky. There's no grip. He's off the road, and Loggy might now be back into third. He's going to have the momentum into turn two, isn't he? Loggy's down the inside, just needs to break at the same point as Orange. Not too late and take his teammate out. I really think Cottingham there should have asked the question of Ferguson. He was getting squeezed up to the grass into the bomb hole. It was was in his right, he had an overlap to stay there. I think Ferguson then would have turned himself around the front of Cottingham and gone into a different Norfolk postcode, but that's not a problem to Cottingham. He, he just hasn't attacked at the right point. I'm so frustrated for him. He's so fast, he's such a good driver. I really think he had opportunities today to be in front of Ferguson, but we're getting to the point of the race where I, I just don't think he's going to get a clean cut 
opportunity. And I think Orange was on that front foot, little aggressive. We know how slippy it is offline here. And that really showed he did a good job to keep it on some of the black stuff, at least. The two drivers in this battle, oh, I'm very strange line into Williams. The two drivers in this battle who have been the most aggressive are John Ferguson and Simon Orange, the two who are not fighting for the championship. And I think that's the only reason that Cottingham hasn't done any of the things you've been telling him he should do. He's got to try and score the points. He's outscoring all of the other championship contenders. As much as the Red Mist is descending, as much as he wants another race victory, the points for second place are worth going for with one lap to go. Is it really worth a tangle with John Ferguson that could take you both out of the race and really scoop your championship hopes? Shut up with your good logic and strategy <laughs> there. I'd much prefer to have a send back. You are right. He's still going to score mega, mega points and championship always the focus. See uh, another championship leader here. Really happy with their, their day. They're going to extend that, like you said earlier. costume has got another run. This will be going on. It's going to be so close to their last lap as they cross the line. One minute 51, and their last lap was a one minute 50.8. So they should get two more laps by a tenth of the second. The race director be today. He's got a big decision to make. Sometimes we see him actually declare it's the last lap to let the teams know. But that one was going to be tight to call. Costume's still looking so strong, isn't he? Under breaking, but John Ferguson has just done such a mega job. And I think what we've got to remember is he is leading the race because of that move he did on Ian Loggy round Coram early, early early on in his stint. I think it was their outlap, in fact, wasn't it? Or second lap anyway. So they're doing well wide again. What's Cottonroom got? Is he going to go to the inside? I don't think he's really close enough. We know that uh, Ferguson's good on the brakes. Can he get it into the apex? Does on this occasion, actually. He's really tidied up his act through Agostini. He was out breaking himself a lot there earlier on, but now he's able to get into the corner quickly, but stop it, rotate it on the apex. And really now, James Cottingham running out of obvious overtaking opportunities. He's not close enough into Oggies. The next one, and possibly the last real one, is at the end of the Bentley straight. He's been close before a couple of times. He's got himself alongside John Ferguson at the end of this straight. He is is more than close enough to have a go, or at least ask the question of Ferguson, but is he going to commit to the move? We've got 41 seconds left on the clock, and I think given the fact that Ferguson's been defending a bit more on this lap, it could be a slightly slower lap, might end up being checkered flag this time. I was just looking as they came into the final sector, the final sector had been doing mid-36s, there's 37 seconds remaining of it. Another run, not quite as big as the one before, into the bomb hole, but still so, so close. I'm looking across from our commentary position, looking for the checkered flag. Let's treat it like it is the last lap, just in case we're not treated to one more. I'd pay a lot of my money to get one more lap, because I still think there's something in this. We saw Cost and lead over the line, didn't we? Are we going to get that? Is he going to get over the line in front, even if it's not a clean overtake? Checker flag would be shown that first end of the concrete bit isn't shown from what I can see. They've given them another lap. Let's another go. Lap. They are side by side. There's getting another lap of racing and somehow Ferguson is still the race leader. Outbreaks himself. Cottingham was ahead by 17,000. There's traffic up the road as well. What more do you need? On the inside, steam. Simon Orange for third place. Contact with Ian Loggy, who tried to close the door far too late and Orange goes through into third position. Now, what can he do? How does that change the dynamic between the two AMGs in front of him? GT4 traffic up the road though, Joe. What does this mean? So close. The timing screens initially showed Costing leading. Ferguson now was in the lead by four hundredths of a second. So I think it was so close. The timing transponders were probably sending out slightly different frequencies for the timers to work out who was in front. Big sound of skid marks oh, it's there. Loggy. It's Loggy and Orange. They've tangled an Agostini battling over third place. And that, we didn't see from that angle clearly what happened, but there has obviously been contact between the two. And that is the reigning champion off the road. He'll still rejoin in third, I think. And hopefully Simon Orange in fourth place. But it means it's now just a two-horse race, cutting them all over the grass as he heads out of Oggies. And look at the sea of GT4 cars to be negotiated. In a way, they're catching them on the perfect part of the circuit, down the Bentley straight. Will they clear all of them before they get to the end of it, though? I don't think they will. Advantage Ferguson for now, but he's... Oh, and Cottingham is slowing. Is he out of fuel, Joe? Possibly. I'm trying to think what it was. He had made a big mistake, which I was aggrieved uh, that he wasn't going to get a chance. But what's he doing? Everything looks all right. Ram is celebrating early. Well, you're brave, boys. Um, uh, yeah. <laughs> but if, exactly. it, if it was fuel, then I would be expecting to see maybe. I think what we're seeing is the checkered flag's actually been shown, even though it wasn't oh. physically out. The timing screen is now updated to show the checkered flag was out. The drivers definitely didn't know that because they were fighting all the way. So I'm sorry that we made half of, of an in-lap <laughs> very sound, very exciting, but we were not shown that straight away. So really, really strange. And even strange, like I said at the time, cutting on the timing screen was in front for a split second on that last lap. It was so, so tight anyway. It's so hard, but I mean, 
Can I say I'm angry? I can say I'm angry that the, the checker flag wasn't shown and we were robbed. But is that, in hindsight, going to give Cottingham a lot of luck? Is he broken down on an in-lap? I'm seeing safety car boards being shown and everything. So there's been uh, some, some turmoil. I actually saw Raphael Marcello running down the pit lane. So should we talk about that? You're angry. I'm confused. I don't know what's happening. I really and Ian Loggy and Simon Orange aren't going to be best pleased either because they've got broken racing cars now. Somehow we've got to decide not only who wins the race but who finished third. That is the most bizarre conclusion to a race I've ever seen. It was setting up to be a thriller of a finish, but it on the timing screen appears that Ferguson's the winner. I think they're putting Cottingham though in the number one board. Is that in the middle because he did have his nose ahead at the line, didn't he? So. I'm we glad you're are. the pro commentator, Andy. I'm just going to stand here in <laughs> silence. All right. Should I we just go with that's uh, one of the best British GT races we've ever seen at Snetterton? Agreed. I hate this circuit. It's normally so <laughs> boring to watch cars, but we have just seen one of the most intense battles ever. Let's see their body languages. Ferguson looks pretty happy, so they obviously look like they've won. Loggy and Cottingham look pretty happy. Bryn Lucas there is always looking confused with his demeanour, so he doesn't really <laughs> let us elude. That was an easy win, however, though, so we talk about that one as well. Great job by the Optimum guys. DTO doing really, really well as well to come in second place there, and the uh, the R Racing uh, Aston Martin in third place, rounding out the overall GT4 podium. Right, OK. Um, they have put the 2Cs car in the number one parking space. John Ferguson is arguing that he should be in the number one parking space, and Bryn Lucas has the unfortunate job uh, of now having to go and speak to them. They're perhaps about to swap things around. Our timing screen says John Ferguson was ahead by 42 thousandths of a second at the time of the chequered flag, whenever that happened to be. Uh, there is Ian Loggy. Now, how does he feel about all of this? Aggrieved, I'm sure, uh, at the contact that he had with Simon Orrick, but it looks as though he will be third position uh, as confusion reigns supreme here at Snetterton. Joe is absolutely right, though. That was some of the best side-by-side -side racing I've seen in this championship for a long, long time. Right then, Bryn, I'm hoping you can shed some light on what's going on here. Um, I have no idea what to say to you, John. I mean, what a fight you had at the end there. Four cars don't go into one, as we know, and we think you just pipped it at the post. <laughs> to be honest, I thought it was second. I thought they asked him his way up the road. I didn't even know they asked him was gone. Well, uh, as according to our time, it's because you won. <laughs> you won here last year as well, so you got good form round Snetterton. Absolutely, but obviously this man here is uh, engine that drives all this, you know. Well, let's find out the thoughts then of your teammate. I mean, a, a decent stint for yourself to start with, and then you hand over the, the car to, to John. He had his work cut out. Were you on the radio? Were you talking to him all the way through? No, I mean, it's better to let him do the work. He's, I mean, he, he had a lot of pressure, so it's better if he focused, but I mean, he did uh, an amazing job. I mean, uh, it was aggressive enough, but uh, yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's a nice win. Just talk us very briefly about the battle from your point of view, because, I mean, you had to do so much defending. James was trying to find his way through at every moment. Well, obviously, we know James is very, very quick. He's probably, well, he is the quickest arm there is. And I knew he was going to be coming. And it was a matter of making sure that the car at the apexes, uh, no track limits, and just try and keep powering out of the corner. There was a few times it was close, but I just dug in, and thank goodness we did. You're dug in with everything you have. Well done there. And I'm going to hand back to you as I find the GT4 race winners. Well done there to John and to Raffaele. Right. Well, I think I can tell you who won in GT4 with some certainty because that was a runaway victory in the end for the uh, number 90 machine, uh, which has been doing a lot of that really in 2022 so far. Jack Brown and Charles Clark victorious in GT4. Second uh, in the end went the way of the DTO McLaren and third for our racing as Carl Caver slipped down into fourth place but still won the Pro-Am category. We were distracted, I hope understandably, by everything that was kicking off uh, in GT3 at that moment, uh, but it is a GT4 victory for the number 80 McLaren and uh, the number 90 McLaren, I should say, from Optimum Motorsport. And they are now down there in Part Ferme, uh, I believe, ready to have a catch up with Bryn Lucas. Well, Jack, how many times are we going to talk to you this season and say amazing, amazing, amazing? But you two, you really had that one fleshed out from the very start, didn't you? It was a, a, a great performance, almost an uninterrupted performance for you both. 
yeah, it was uh, it was difficult out there. Um, the track was very dirty, made it very difficult. But we weren't expecting to win this weekend, to be honest. Um, we had a good qualifying, but we thought the Genetics had the pace. But um, Jack did a great job all weekend, and we're glad to have a win at the end of it. I said to you at the start of the race about you know, the championship points and your mindset going into each race. You've got three races to go now. I mean, I don't want to say to you you've got a thumbnail on that trophy, but you know it's getting closer and closer, isn't it? You seem to be extending the lead each time. Yeah, you know, that's the plan. We want to win the championship, so we're just going to carry on as we are, not take any risks, keep our head down, and we'll hopefully get there. Be consistent, banging the points. I think your lead now is essentially a race win at one of the, the, the final uh, races. I didn't think that. <laughs> but, um, we're not really thinking about um, the championship at the moment. We're trying to... Uh, well, I think we've lost uh, Bryn uh, down in part for May. Everything's going on uh, in the uh, end of this uh, final race of the weekend. Let's tell you what we believe to be the race result. Victory for Ram Racing, the number 15 car. Uh, and uh, that is John Ferguson and Raffaele Marcello victorious. Again, their fourth win in the last three years at Snetterton and Ferguson. Second, he won here uh, with Elise de Pau a year ago, remember, in a similarly thrilling race, I seem to remember. Second place for the Two Seas Motorsport car of Johnny Adam and James Cottingham, like back into the points lead now, although I'll do the maths later. Ian Loggins, and Jules Goon on their teammates joining them on the podium. Then it was Simon Orange and Michael O'Brien in fourth position, Darren Leung and Dan Harper in fifth, and then Callum McLeod in uh, the Greystone GT car. Sixth place, one of their best results yet. Then it was Enduro, Sky Tempesta Racing, Barwell, the race one winners were ninth, and Panic Motorsport inside the top ten. Moving down then to GT4, Jack Brown and Charles Clark claiming another race victory within the GT4 category. Their second of the year, but they've only been off the podium twice in the first six races this season. DTO Motorsport second, and as I said, it is the R Racing Aston Martin that completed uh, the podium runners. Uh, this is a replay of the uh, leading group crossing the line. This is the moment at which the race was declared. So that was the winning margin. The next thing we need to figure out is what the closest British GT finish has been. There was one of Brands Hatch, wasn't there, a number of years ago that maybe was a fraction closer, but it doesn't get much closer than that, that is for sure. And that is the moment at which we believe the race was won. Right then, how to sum this up in three minutes or less? Let's remind you of some of the action from that second race of the weekend here in Snetterton in the Intelligent Money British GT Championship. It was, if you can cast your minds back that long ago, Ross Gunn who led through the first corner, the Beach Dean Aston Martin inheriting pole position after the withdrawal of the number 88 McLaren. Jules Gounon did his best to challenge to the outside of the Wilson hairpin, almost opened the door for Raffaele Marcello as some of the greatest GT drivers in the world did battle at Snetterton. Contact then between the race leaders in GT4 Four. Mike Simpson was subsequently handed a penalty for that, and the number 90 car rejoined remarkably quickly, still in second place. That car would go on to eventually win the GT4 race. Battling amongst the pro drivers in the first part of the race was as intense as we're used to seeing. Sam Neary there battling away with Will Tregertha, uh, whilst Chris Robert kept a watching brief. Then into the pit window, the pros staying out as late as they possibly could, and this was where the drama really started because the Beach Dean car was too short in the pit lane, came out as the leader, but was given a penalty, and then John Ferguson managed to make a miraculous pass against Ian Loggy to get into what would become the race lead. However, those two were battling hard. They were being caught by James Cottingham, the fastest and driver in qualifying yesterday, and he was making some brilliant moves around the outside of Loggy through Rich's corner, and at this point looked almost a certainty for the race win. There was the pass for the lead in GT4 because the number 90 car had to come back against the Century Motorsport BMW, which had had a much shorter pit stop. Simon Orange then joined in the fun to make it a four-way fight for the victory, rattling up the inside of Ian Loggy for third place in the closing stages. Then a bit of confusion at the end. The chequered flag wasn't shown, but this was the finish of the race. John Ferguson handing up, hanging on by less than half a tenth of a second to claim his second victory here at Snetterton and breathe, everybody. That was, well, everything we hoped for, really, from a 60-minute sprint race in British GT. And we do now get the drivers making their way up onto the podium uh, to celebrate, perhaps, if they feel like it. Ian Loggy doesn't look like in uh, a particularly celebratory mood, does he? Understandable, really, after that collision that he had, two collisions that he had uh, with Simon Orange in the closing stages. But he and Jules Gounon finish in third in his second place for James Cottingham and Johnny Adam. But the win here in the second race at Snetterton goes to Ram Racing. And it's John Ferguson and Raffaele Marcello who claim the win. And that will be, I believe, Marcello's first victory in British GT as well. One of the real hot signings coming in 
into 2023. Fantastic to have him on the grid. And he is a race winner in the second race of the weekend here at Snetterton. That uh, second place then for uh, Cottingham and Adam, netting them 18 championship points. Of course, the Century Motorsport pairing of Darren Leung and Dan Harper finished in fifth. That gives them 10 points, uh, and I reckon uh, will now put the 2Cs car back in front by a decent little margin as the champagne flies on top the Snetterton podium. And uh, there will be lots of discussions, I think, to be had after what was a race we are not going to forget in a hurry. Now move on to the GT4 top three, where again we saw uh, a fantastic bit of battling, but ultimately the number 90 Optimum Motorsport McLaren of Charles Clark and Jack Brown able to steal the victory and get it away from the Century Motorsport BMW, which unfortunately ended up not on the podium even overall, although as I said, we'll still claim the Pro-Am victory. It was third place then in GT4 for R Racing, Seb Hopkins and Josh Miller. Second place for DTO Motorsport, a solid day for that team, a top six in race one, a second in race two for Aston Miller and Jack, uh, Josh Rowledge. But it was Jack Brown, and Charles Clark victorious in GT4 yet again. I say yet again. Uh, it was uh, only the second win that they've had this year. It feels like they've won a few more times, but that's because they've been on the podium in four of the uh, first six races we've had this year. Three more races to go this year. And uh, they are looking odds-on favourites, not only to win the championship, but potentially to do it with a round or two to spare. Remember, the British GT Championship heads next abroad, not to Spa, as has traditionally been the case, uh, but a little bit further south to some even warmer climbs because we're heading to Algarve to the Portimao circuit on the south coast of Portugal. And that is going to be the first appearance for the Intelligent Money British GT Championship uh, in Portugal. Then we head back to the UK to Brands Hatch and it all finishes at Donington Park, the traditional Donington decider uh, at the end of the year where, well, certainly the GT3 categories are likely to be very hotly contested, but will GT4 have been wrapped up before then? Only time will tell. Now we start to move on to uh, other podium ceremonies that need to be handled. This is the GT3 Silver Am uh, category. The Neary's coming home in uh, third position. And then uh, second place within that class was the Race Lab McLaren. And the win going to Sky 10 Best of Racing. Kevin Say and Chris Frog are getting themselves a class victory. And uh, they finished in the end in that one, eighth place overall. So again, a solid day for them, really. The Neary's had a bit of an up and down one, didn't they? Having run well inside the top five in race one. Race two, not quite as favourable for them, uh, but they look pretty happy to be up there on the class podium. And the new Evo kit working well on their uh, certainly not very new Mercedes AMG GT3, but clearly still has some good pace in it. So the champagne flies, very nonchalant opening of the champagne bottle there for <laughs> Chris Froggart, who has done a lot of racing around Europe, but actually we don't see a lot here in the UK these days. But uh, he manages to claim himself uh, another class win alongside Kevin Say, who's been a bit of a revelation in British GT over recent years. Remember, had that fantastic race victory at Alton Park a couple of years ago, alongside uh, Tom Onslow Cole. And... Well, not quite an overall race victory today, but uh, a top step of the podium nonetheless is not a bad way uh, to complete your afternoon's work. And then finally, the GT4 Pro-Am uh, podium takes place and we start with uh, the uh, Ian Goff and Tom Wrigley Race Lab McLaren. Second place went to Carl Cavers and Lewis Plato in the Century Motorsport BMW. But it was Jack Brown and... Uh, at it was uh, Carl Cavers and Lewis Plato, excuse me, who took the class win. Secondly, in Duggan and Tom Wrigley. It is, though, the uh, BMW that claimed the victory at the end of a tough 60 minutes of racing. It was almost a overall GT4 victory. But, uh, the class win and a solid top five in the outright uh, result is more than enough to keep them happy, I'm sure, on the journey home. So more celebrations, a big crowd gathered underneath the podium, as always is the case, and uh, fairly confined space, the Snetterton podium, actually. They're all crammed in there, uh, nowhere to run when the champagne starts to fly, but I don't think the assembled crowd are going to mind too much about that. 
Well, what a thrilling conclusion to our British GT action here at Snetterton. Three more races to go. The GT3 Championship couldn't be much more finely poised. Be, be sure to join us next time as we head to Portugal.